Today, we're very happy to welcome Barbara Castaneda to our weekly astrophysics seminar. Um, Barbara did her PhD at the University of Texas at Austin, spent some time as a postdoc at the University of Vienna, and came back to Texas, where uh, she's now a lecturer at Baylor University. And today, we're going to hear about white dwarfs in the HET dark energy experiment. And we'll have uh, people, we, we usually try to keep this fairly informal so that people can jump in with questions, if that's all right with you. So I'll be, I'll be looking at the list and if, if anyone clicks their raise hand symbol, I'll just uh, jump in and, and interrupt at a good moment, hopefully. And then if, uh, just so everyone knows, we're also gonna hold a group discussion at uh, 2 p.m. Eastern today for anyone that would like to join and continue discussing. So with that, please take it away. Thank you, thank you very much. Um, I remember a, a dinner conversation we had this summer with my kids and they were upset because, they were still upset in summer because we had to cancel our trip uh, for spring break. And uh, I told them, well, unfortunately you don't know half of the trips we had planned. And uh, this was one that I was truly looking forward to spend time there. And uh, I even had a master plan of flying them to, uh, to New York and spend a beautiful weekend after the, the week I was going to have there. So I was like, <laughs> you, I told them, you guys have no idea. <laughs> but we will do what we can. And I'm very happy to be here today talking to you folks. And um, I know also it's a, a mad, madness week that we all have this deadline coming up on Monday, right? And we're all working on our proposals. So I thought, hmm, maybe I'm gonna talk about the things which I'm currently working on and uh, that I'm actually proposing for NSF. So it's actually pretty good. I have some new plots to show and it's always exciting. So uh, the title of this talk is um, White Dwarfs in the HET Dark Energy Experiment. Uh, of course, we usually start the talks with uh, pretty pictures, but this is not a picture of a white dwarf. This is actually a picture of um, a planetary nebula, as we know, because if I would show the picture of a white dwarf, it would just be a, a simple dot back there. But eventually the center part that is hidden behind the X in this picture is going to become a white dwarf. Um, we see lots of, I mean, there are lots of things that we can learn already uh, by looking at this picture. So. There, there may be uh, different events of uh, ejections going on, possibly uh, interactions with binary systems or maybe interactions with magnetic field and other effects. So um, this is something that we, we don't ignore when we talk about white dwarfs. Um, anyway, so for, oops, sorry, for the, the students uh, in the group, I don't know if there is any, but just to remind us what we are looking at. Uh, we are not looking at, uh, if you look at the standard picture for a single stellar evolution, we have that small stars will go through the red giant phase, the planetary nebula that I just showed the picture, and then they will eventually become white dwarfs. Now, the massive stars are the ones that are more spectacular, and they have a much faster evolutionary time, and they will become, they will explode in a supernova event, becoming a neutron star, maybe a black hole. Uh, and, and they actually nowadays drive much more attention and, um, from everybody, but uh, I still like to show this picture for the importance of the white wars because 95% uh, of all single stars that are born in the galaxy will follow this small star evolution and they will probably become um, a white dwarf in the end. So understanding white dwarfs is per se, in terms of the number in the statistics of stars that will evolve to become white dwarfs, very, very important. So we put uh, uh, a constraint in our stellar evolutionary models because the, we have a wide variety of metallicities, a wide variety of initial masses, so up to eight to 10.5 solar masses, depending on models. Uh, all those stars will eventually become uh, white dwarfs. Now, to make things a little bit more interesting, this is my, I think, my favorite picture in astronomy, which has nothing to do with white dwarfs, but it has to do with star formation. But I think this is a majestic picture. I always like that since I'm a, a, a student. And uh, 
this is a picture that illustrates for us that reminds us that stars are not born in isolation. So when we talk about uh, evolution of stars, we have to take into account binarity. So we know that there's a significant fraction of stars that are born in binarity. And even though binarity becomes even more important for massive stars, for the low mass stars, we have something like two thirds of all stars would definitely be in binary systems. That will allow, uh, if they have interactions uh, and mass transfer events, I have to keep on changing with the direction of people in my screen just to make sure that I can see all the pictures here. Um, so if they have, oh, there we go. <laughs> if they have mass transfer here, uh, depending on the, uh, the geometry of the system, they can actually transfer mass. And of course, transferring mass will alter the stellar evolution for those stars. So uh, this possibility, for example, uh, becomes exciting and there's other effects that can happen. So we can have nova explosions. Uh, we can also have something that will uh, bring us to the next point of the, of the talk, which is whenever white dwarfs reach uh, the Chandrasekhar limit and uh, uh, the pressure, the degeneracy pressure of the electrons can no longer support gravity, the star will collapse. And this collapse is what and it, this should be happening uh, whenever for a single star, for example, that uh, uh, around the mass above 1.4 solar masses, uh, typically. Of course, there's some dependency on magnetic field and, and other effects. but. Typically, uh, this is the one of the explanations for the observations of the supernova type 1a. We also have the scenario where a double degenerate pair would merge and form once again, uh, maybe another star, maybe uh, a supernova, like once again, a supernova type 1a. And uh, so Despite that white dwarfs are not necessarily very spectacular by themselves, they, they come in a spectacular number. So again, 95% of all stars will evolve to, uh, to become white dwarfs. And some of them will actually evolve to become supernovas, which are very spectacular per se. So there's a lot of implications uh, in, terms of, um, in terms of their evolution and understanding those stars and understanding the structure of those stars as well. So uh, here is a collection of light curves for supernova and I put uh, here different types of supernova and we can see here the black line, it is the type 1a supernova. The shape of this curve is pretty much the same uh, and, and that's good news. The other curves here are thought to be uh, coming from the evolution of massive stars and uh, massive stars, um, once again, they, they are less uh, much less common, they evolve much faster. But uh, the massive stars will produce a supernova that is highly dependent uh, of the, uh, again, the previous uh, ejecta, uh, pre previous events of mass loss, previous eruptions maybe. So there's a lot of other factors that will uh, determine possibly this shape of this light curve. So they are not necessarily uh, very good, very standard, first of all, and they are not the typical standard candles that we have. So uh, for type 1a supernova, the brightness would increase at a certain level. They become really, really bright, you know, it's typically the, the, the brightness of uh, uh, a small galaxy even, and uh, in, in absolute terms, but they will fade away. But the shape of the curve is always the same. So we can actually use this uh, stretch effector to try to determine uh, the distance that this event have occurred. So type 1a supernovas are our standard candles. Of course, beyond that, we use Hubble's laws and so on. But to bring things into even context, I haven't even mentioned dark energy yet, but here, here we get to the point of uh, bringing dark energy to the uh, to the mix is that it was with the using the supernova type 1a we know how bright they are and and we can determine the distance and so on so um, when we use this data for the for the supernova we actually I mean we we didn't but we astronomers we we the people right 
uh, so uh, it was uh, evident that uh, there was an acceleration of the expansion of the universe, so a kick on the acceleration. So uh, this was the work done by uh, in, in the late 90s. And uh, the best explanation for this kick of the accelerate, this kick of the accelerate of the expansion of the universe, so there is something that has to be accelerating the universe outwards. Um, this would be that it requires um, something, a type of energy with negative effect to gravity, because after the Big Bang, you know, things would be expanding, and then of course gravity would be able to bring things uh, back together. But that's not what we are observing based on the on the supernova data. So dark energy is the name of this mysterious type of, of entity that we added into cosmology to explain, uh, to try to explain and understand how the expansion of the universe happened. And of course, the destiny of the universe will depend critically upon the nature of dark energy, uh, because we really want to try to understand when it becomes uh, important in the universe and how it will become important and so on. So in order to do that, there has been a lot of surveys um, uh, that want to probe dark energy. And uh, the survey that I will talk about is the HEDEX uh, survey. So uh, the uh, uh, AGT or the Hobby Abelie Telescope, it's, uh, it's a telescope at uh, uh, at McDonald Observatory. Um, so this telescope is pretty interesting because whenever it when it was proposed, it was a very uh, inexpensive telescope for its size. So uh, we say here something like 15 to 20 percent of the actual cost of a nine meter telescope. So compared to Keck, you know, it was 10 percent the cost of the of one of the Kecks. Um, so the primary mirror has a very interesting shape. So it's it's kind of model after the CAC uh, because it has this uh, hexagonal mirrors, uh, more mirrors than uh, the CAC telescope. It has 91 mirrors. But uh, here's the, the catch. It's, it is at a fixed uh, elevation angle. So uh, it's similar to the tilted Arecibo design. So the antenna, I can use my hand here, <laughs> hopefully it will work. So the telescope is fixed and it rotates like this. So typically, if you want to make an observation of something that is over there, you will move the mirror, the primary mirror this way and this way. Okay, so we don't have the capability of moving the telescope like this, but it's always, always fixed at this 55 degrees. How do we access the sky? Well, there is a tracker in the secondary mirror and the tracker will actually follow the star. So when the star is rising in the sky, we follow with the tracker for 45 minutes. And then whenever the star is setting on the other side, if you, we turn the telescope, let me turn the telescope a little bit, turn the telescope, and then you follow for another 45 minutes. So you can access uh, your targets typically for up to an hour and a half uh, during a typical night. Um, so the, it, it's still, again, it's 10% in cost, but 10, 15% in cost, uh, but you still get to access 81% of the sky. Again, because, uh, and of course, in terms of uh, observing with this telescope, it's, uh, I, I still remember when I went to the CAC uh, to visit uh, the telescopes, I thought, wow, that's a tall telescope because I was used to go to, <laughs> to see this one because you have to make sure that you're able to move the telescope in, in, the, in this direction. But uh, so to, to operate this telescope, it is done in queue schedule because you can have, you know, it's, it is the mo most efficient way to do that. So send the proposals and the next morning we receive the data beautifully coming to our... <laughs> there are several um, instruments there. It is a telescope. Uh, designed only for uh, spectroscopy. And uh, this was actually, it, it is a successful telescope, I would say. It took a while to make it working because there are so many moving pieces. The mirrors are actually have to move and, and connect and so on. 
but it has been also uh, the model for the SALT telescope in South Africa. So I have it's a, a question from yeah. Raman. Yes, I have a question. So you say uh, it's 15, 20% of the cost of the telescope, which sort of means that uh, mean that 80% uh, of the cost of a telescope typically goes to this basically support infrastructure, you know, the tilting uh, stuff and so on and so forth. I mean, it, it sounds surprising because usually when we uh, talk about the telescope building costs, we are thinking about, you know, some, um, I mean, we are, the cost is usually expressed as some function of the diameter of the telescope. And here that the diameter is exactly the same as, you know, I mean, or si very similar to CAC or Subaru and so on. Uh, and what you are saying is sounds like, you know, this formula should be actually based on the, you know, support infrastructure and not on the mirror diameter. So I'm a bit puzzled here. Um, what do you mean in terms of the cost? Oh, actually, whenever they, they so, you know, in, in Texas, they got the, the bid to, to, to build this telescope and I, I still remember a value like um, 15 million or 20 million. That was the total cost of the telescope. Yeah, which, which, is, which is quite surprising. I agree. It is, yeah. Then, no. you know, if, if I compare it to other telescopes, I mean, it sounds like then the 80% of the cost would uh, go to, you know, just basically the mechanism that tilts uh, the mirror. And that, that, that sounds a bit weird. I, I, maybe I, maybe the mirrors are still also different from what uh, they used on CAC. Well, they, yeah, no, they cut costs. I mean, the size of the, the building uh, mm -hmm. was a big cut cost. Uh, the size of the mirrors is smaller, so it's easier to make the mirrors. Probably, I, I don't oh, know. Okay. I, I don't know. I'm guessing now. I'm, I'm guessing. Mm -hmm. I know that they, the initial cost was, um, is, I, I mean, they had to put a lot of money to fix some of the mistakes that it took a while to get the telescope going. Let's, <laughs> let's, let's put it this way, to be fully operational. So it took a while. So it took some effort. I don't think the, the, the 15 million that, that it actually costed initially was the true value. I think it was maybe add 10 more maybe, but it was still significantly cheaper, but it took a lot of, it took, a, I, I want to say, something like five years, five to 10 years to get it fully going. So, but yeah, I, I didn't build it. I just, <laughs> just caught it. I, I, I mean, it's surprising myself too, but I think that because the CAC has less, less mirrors and they are bigger. So that, that could be it. That could be, yeah. Okay. okay. But I also, I mean, I think, yeah, being able to point that thing to anywhere in the sky to a Arc second is that's really expensive, so so you you save you can save a lot. If you're yeah, not. and 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 one thing here, so the effective aperture just just for completeness. Uh, so when you have the tracker, the effective aperture is six point five meters, and the effective aperture changes as the as the star goes up. So it's not always at nine point two meters. That's an important detail. So maybe. Maybe it's not a fair comparison to, to do with CAC, but you know, but but it is the number that we usually use. And some people liked it even in South Africa. So <laughs> okay, thanks. Um, okay, so this is a picture, uh, a recent picture. I took this uh, recent last year. Uh, this is the the mirror. Oh, gosh, cannot cannot move. Yeah, there we go. Okay, so this is the mirror that we can see this part here had to be rebuilt, the bottom, the controllers. And, uh, uh, and this is the tracker of the, of the telescope. And um, right here is the new instrument virus that it sits on this, uh, I don't know, bookshelves shelves here on the side of the telescope. Um, so the the HEDEX uh, experiment, uh, so the HEDEX or the the AGT dark experiment, it is actually uh, the cost of HEDEX is more than the cost of the telescope. So I still remember that they spend more money building this instrument than they actually uh, than the telescope itself, and uh, the goal was to is to probe dark energy. So they have planned observations for. Uh, 1400 hours in dark time for seven years. And uh, the technique is uh, 
to measure the expansion of the universe in a redshift from zero to four, roughly. So what they are gonna be observing is uh, Lyman alpha emitting galaxies. Uh, this is a very, very early uh, image of, that they could take with a, a prototype with the virus P, which was the, the instrument. So for that, they actually built this, uh, this instrument virus. And uh, I believe that the, la the latest number that, of targets that, that they chose, they chose those Lyman alpha galaxies because they are very common. And uh, they, uh, they needed like a million of those galaxies. So that's why they, they plan to do this observation for this uh, amount of time in order to get the statistics that they, they would need to, to measure, um, the, to probe dark energy. So what they did is that, so here's a scheme of that picture that I showed. So you can see here those uh, shelves where uh, 156 virus, uh, so virus is um, uh, 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 the spectrograph and they are replicable. So we can make them, they're all the same. And uh, those virus spectrographs are fiber fed into, the into this, uh, from, from the secondary, right, into the, uh, into the, the virus spectrograph. So this is the wavelength coverage. So we don't get H alpha, but we get uh, uh, down to the ultraviolet cutoff of the atmosphere to 5,500 angstrom, so include H beta. About uh, 3,400 spectra per shot. Uh, one thing that they had to do was to increase the field of view to 22 arc seconds. So that's a comparison. This is before, so four arc, uh, 22 arc minutes, sorry. So this was before with four arc minutes, and then this is the new comparison. So it's a pretty big field of view uh, with a resolution of uh, two angstroms, roughly, and the exposure time of 18 minutes um, using dark time. And they, they started this with, um, in 2017, and they will complete the survey in 2023. Um, there is an interesting thing here that um, because the field of view of the, the new up, upgraded is so big, whenever you are uh, observing with a different instrument, there's still a lot of space in the sky. So you can feed the fibers into all those things here. So not only you get uh, all the things that you get with the normal survey, whenever uh, AGT is using the high resolution or the low resolution spectrograph, you can fiber feed into that. So you can do even with that a parallel survey. It's not homogeneous. We don't have a whole lot of flux calibration and all the other things that come with the head -ex. But I mean, it's a lot of data. It's an incredible amount of data that you get for free. So whenever people are looking for planets around, the field, you just put the fibers and the data comes again. It's, it's, it's a beautiful, beautiful design. Can you say one more time, why, why is the four arc minute field there for reference? Oh, that was the old, that, uh, the old field of view. So they actually made it bigger so they could fiber feed the whole thing. So that was a big upgrade on the telescope itself. And that allows the, the parallel survey. So, um, it's an IFU, so we have here uh, a design. Th this is just for comparison that one of the early observations that we made with, um, with a subdwarf. Uh, and uh, it is an IFU, so it's important to make the dithering to make sure that we complete all the, all the uh, we get all the data, all the flux from, this, from, the, from the targets. Um, in, this was from the virus P, the prototype which is still a uh, an instrument available at the 2.7 meter telescope. But with virus, we need to do three dithers in order to get the total flux of the objects. Otherwise something could be off outside one of the fibers. And, uh, and yeah, we, it is flux calibrated and uh, because they also need that for, um, for their observations with, um, with the galaxies. Um, so then everything that falls into the fibers, and here's an example of my, of the target that I was looking at that in this observation, but everything else gets data. So we can even recover all the stars and all the objects that are in the fiber. So why are they looking for Lyman alpha galaxies, which I, I, I'm not looking at those targets at all. All the stars will actually be 
uh, observed and so on. So that's the, basically their trash. <laughs> and uh, so uh, just to, to mention here a few in interesting things more for, for white dwarfs. White dwarfs will allow us to study and probe physics at very extreme conditions. So we have here um, a mass distribution from um, the SDSS. This was done with the DR4. It's an old one, but it's still pretty centered at 0.6 solar masses. Um, we have some more massive uh, stars also here. Uh, this end, which is the low mass end, is coming from binary evolution. And in terms of the size of the white dwarfs, they're typically the size of, of planet Earth. So I joke with my kids when I'm telling them about how, how dense is a white dwarf. We will just shrink a great white shark and put it in a playing dice. That's the typical density that, that you get for white dwarfs. And another interesting thing, this picture here is, a, again, it's an old cartoon showing that as white dwarfs cool down, um, they will eventually crystallize. So this was a diamond in the sky that we actually found with, um, with pulsations. So it's a, it's a star that we, we determined that was probably uh, significantly crystallized in the center. Uh, so yeah, you can, you can study lots and lots of things. Another, uh, one of my, my major focus on research is the pulsating white dwarf. So this is a, an HR diagram showing all the, the shaded areas where the stars pulsate. And we can see here the white dwarf cooling sequence. And as the stars pass through this cooling sequence, uh, they will show pulsations. So pulsations is, rough, is an evolutionary phase for white dwarfs. Um, our understanding of pulsations in white dwarfs is, uh, it's, it's pretty, pretty, I would say it's pretty remarkable because we understood the mechanism so well that to drive pulsations for the DAVs here. So the DAs are the ones with hydrogen and the B, DBs are the ones depleted of hydrogen, so with helium. We understood that there was something to do with the recombination, the kappa, kappa gamma mechanism. So we have increase of opacity and we have the, new, the, the hydrogen become neutral again, that uh, the DBVs, which are the ones with helium, were the first class of variables that was predicted to pulsate before it was actually observed. So this is, this is something really powerful because you not stumble across a variable, you are actually looking for something because it was predicted theoretically. And I think this, is, this shows how well we understand qualitatively. Of course, there's always improvement to be done in the models, but it's really remarkable. This is one of the, the white dwarfs that I found, the DAV in the K2 data. So that's, again, another interesting thing. We can still look for, for stuff out there. And the data is all published, and, all public, and, and, but we're still finding new, uh, new stars, uh, new variables all the time. One interesting thing is that the white dwarfs do not pulsate in many modes. So we have intrinsically just a few independent modes of pulsation. So this is a Fourier transform. And uh, we see some, uh, 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 some uh, linear combinations, some harmonics, even with the K2 data, which is uh, you know, days and the weeks and weeks of data, continuous data set from space, which is fantastic. We haven't seen many more than, I would say, something like 10 uh, modes, roughly, for the DAVs. And uh, yet, we are trying to use those pulsations to understand the internal structure of those stars. So those are models for the internal structures. And you can see here, let's, we can look at the lower panel. So those are different for each one of those, um, those instability strips, where for the lower panel, we have hydrogen, helium, carbon, and oxygen, typically. So this would be a star with 0.6 solar mass, very standard star, 12,000 Kelvin. Now, if you only have, let's say, 10 <laughs> observables, independent pulsations, there are only 10 things that you can learn about a star. And uh, we are trying to use the pulsations to probe the internal st structure of those stars. So how do you know that my desk here, my desk is black. So how do we know this is made of wood? I knock and you hear the sound. So we can, I can knock on the leg of my desk. I don't know if you guys can hear. 
it's metal, right? So by hearing the pulsations, by understanding the pulsations, we would see how this structure, the internal, the fine structure of the star is. But, but let's see what we are trying to learn. We are trying to learn the mass of the star, the temperature of the star, the hydrogen mass, the helium mass, the carbon mass, and the oxygen mass. I count six things here. And then we have all these functions that the transitions between each one of them. So at the least, we would need three more per thing. So I'm sorry, I'm, 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 I don't have more fingers to count all the, all the variables that intrinsically we really, really wanted to determine with pulsation. So we have to do some compromises, of course, because they, they don't have so many pulsate independent modes. But again, it's a, we, are, we are making some progress here. I cannot talk about surveys without mentioning the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, which is something that changed the field for, for changed many fields in, in astrophysics. Um, I'm not that old, but I remember the times whenever we knew 2000 white dwarfs, that's all we knew. And then Sloan came and then it, the number was 10, it was 10 times. So it was 20,000 white dwarfs and then 40,000 white dwarfs and so on. The, the, and this Sloan is really fantastic. And so it, it actually showed us even different flavors of white dwarfs or different kinds of white dwarfs that we didn't know. Like there is one white dwarf that's just oxygen, which is something that there's, doesn't even have the helium layer. <laughs> the this loan also showed us some binaries, some some other fantastic things with companions to the white dwarfs because we have here a spectral coverage that is much larger than the one that that we are doing. The problem with this loan, if there is a problem here, is well, it's a much smaller telescope, a two point five meter. The problem is um, it's it it has fibers, so we have a certain number. So we have the plates and you physically have fibers, a limited number of fibers that you can use for each plate. So there is a selection effect going on. So the targets to be done by spect spectroscopic observations are pre-selected targets. Uh, in the early days of Sloan, and I'm not saying this is the case right now, but really in the early days, um, the, one of the, the major goals were, were quasars. So they were looking for blue, faint stuff. Yes, white dwarfs came in handy, blue faint stuff, there we go. Now, uh, this has changed. So in, in the very early, uh, you know, DR1, DR2, there was a lot of white dwarfs because they were looking for, to make the distinction between quasars and, and, and those objects. Another thing, the hot white dwarfs are very good uh, for calibration, flux calibration. So they were targeting those hot white dwarfs as well. So we got a lot of data, but we have to, to remember and to keep in mind that the spectroscopic observations of Sloan are biased and they are biased at, at different stages. And uh, we had some close collaborators working at the Sloan at that time. So they told us what was going on. And, and, and those bias are something difficult to take into account if you don't have just the, uh, the limit from, from the magnitude. So this is one of the, the best white dwarf luminosity functions that we have now. And uh, this was constructed with Sloan data. So they try to use then the photometry to, to take into account the completeness of their sample. So of course, this is a very difficult task to do. But again, we can see here the, the, mag the, the, the magnitude to be uh, 16 is the last point here. But again, because uh, white dwarfs, uh, because white, the, the universe didn't have enough time to, cool, to evolve, to cool down. So those white dwarfs, they actually carry, they have imprinted all the information of stellar evolution in, 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 in the galaxy as well. Um, and Gaia, of course, we cannot talk about uh, Gaia came, came in handy. So now the number of white dwarfs that we have, the white dwarf candidates jumped to 400,000. Uh, we still don't have spectra, but here and you can see the white dwarfs on this, this end of Gaia. So we went from 2,000 to 40,000 out to 
I don't know, 200,000. It's a big number. It's, it's, every time it's an order of magnitude, pretty much. Um, and one interesting thing that Gaia actually, uh, the, from the Gaia result is this, uh, this I, I'm not entirely sure if you can see that there is a little bit of, there are several sequences here in the white dwarf cooling sequence. So in this paper, they actually talked about uh, that we are, uh, we are seeing effects of crystallization on stars uh, in the field. And uh, that's something really remarkable and really interesting to be able to, to detect based on the, on the colors of the stars pretty much. So HEDEX and Gaia will become very handy for us because we, we want to be able to use all the information that we have. So um, uh, Keith uh, is, is le was leading this, uh, this paper. So this is the first STARS paper that we were able to publish with, with HEDEX data. So um, the HEDEX collaboration actually put together uh, some, <laughs> some, some of their trash and they call them continuous sources that they don't have any of those emissions and they gave it to, to us. So we are the working group of uh, STARS and uh, we cross match that with the Gaia data. So here we have the, the footprint of the, the HEDEX field and some of the, the Gaia sample. And uh, so this will be uh, HEDEX, we expect to be uh, a magnitude, I mean, it is a magnitude limit sample, but when you compare with the best one that we had, it's not Sloan, but uh, it is the PG survey from when you talk about spectroscopy. So here we have um, the signal to noise uh, as a function of G magnitude. So we can see that we can, okay, I'm not gonna say that we can go all the way to 23, but we can go pretty good to something like 20 or 21 even. So we are really increasing the number of stars and we are increasing the number of white wars for which we have spectra and we have a sample that we can construct a white dwarf luminosity function. And uh, of course, inside this sample, we're gonna have a lot of candidates for pulsations. We're gonna have other types of white dwarf as well. So it's a, it's a very rich, uh, rich sample that we have access to. Um, this is uh, one of our histograms uh, showing uh, the parallax for those stars. Typically, uh, this is the distribution of the in terms of the Gaia colors, uh, the Gaia magnitude G band and the BP minus RP from the Gaia. And um, so this is something uh, really cool that uh, one of the postdocs are actually working on. And uh, so this is a, a, a machine learning way to find stars because now we have all this data. So we have, um, I think from the DR2, 100,000 stars. So for the first observations, we're still able to go ahead and look by eye, but nowadays with 100,000 stars, it gets a little old to do that. There's not enough uh, people to do that. And we should do, so we, we actually did this. Um, this is the TSNE machine learning technique. So it's a 2D projection. So they try to actually group the stars basically by their similarities. And uh, so here we have some of the, the cool stars or the, the hot stars. So we can look for some patterns in, into whatever these groupings happen. So uh, for this paper here, we were focusing on metal poor stars. So we were looking, there's a lot of science that can be done with that. Obviously you can see there's lots of types of stars uh, in, the, in our sample. So we were trying to use the uh, low resolution to calculate the radio velocities for those stars. And uh, we, we're also looking into the, the metallicity of, uh, and, and focusing on the metal poor stars. Um, so this, this diagram here is one of my favorites that, that we can show all those, <laughs> those, those, all those stars and it's color coded because, uh, and we see here the, all the ones that have been observed with HEDEX. So we have here from M stars all the way to, uh, you know, yeah, we don't go much further than, <laughs> than A stars pretty much. And then we have the white dwarfs, which are on top here. So those are stacked averaged. Uh, so they are all the observations averaged from, from the ones that we, that we get. So we got um, a lot of stars. 
There are some white dwarfs that have a slightly different spectral type. So most of them are DA. So this is a typical of, uh, for hydrogen. So those very broad uh, hydrogen lines. Um, but uh, yeah, this is, yeah, but some of them are, are, are DBs over there, but just a small percentage. Um, so one thing which, I, which is uh, really cool about the, the HEDEX data is that it's very, uh, it's very uniform. It's always dark time. It's always um, 18 minutes exposure. So we're observing the same time, the same conditions, the same, yeah, it's all very, very uniform. Same dither pattern, so three dithers, so pretty flux calibrated reduced with the same uh, with the same softwares they, they have the cure and they have the vaccine because it's a virus so I know it's not very good to talk about this these days but uh, but it's very uniform now as I mentioned before so here is one thing that we expect to get like to magnet uh, to be 23 of a signal to noise 3 but we also have additional data from the parallel survey so as I mentioned before if we have somebody observing planets, exosolar planets, and those fields are going to be hit on over and over and over. We can still look for, uh, but, but they are hit differently. The, the exposure times is different, but there is still data over there. So one thing that we can do is actually to look for uh, white dwarfs based on the colors. So we don't have information about flux calibration to make sure there is, but, but we have some information about color. So, this is um, one work done with the Sloan data. So those UG minus, uh, U minus G and G minus R. So this dotted line here is the predicted white dwarfs. Those are quasars. So they're trying to separate the stars. That's obviously the main sequence here. So I actually put those uh, blue dots on top. So those are the UG minus, uh, U minus G and G minus R for the white dwarfs that we have that we have found, even if it didn't have any information about flux. Um, uh, this is finally the, I think my, uh, my, my final results. So I'm actually uh, working on the paper as soon as NSF is done on Monday, Monday afternoon, I'm gonna start working on this, back to work on this paper. So uh, this is the spectra that you get from white dwarfs. And uh, I mean, just, just to point out this, uh, pretty decent uh, signal to noise spectra that we got for free. I, I am from the time that I had to spend days working on an observing proposal to get this many, uh, this many spectra. And I might not even get to this signal to noise. It would take many, a lot of telescope hours for that. And this is coming to us basically for free, effortlessly, <laughs> you know, and, and this is pretty remarkable. Um, some of those stars here, I mean, this is and the magnitude because I mean uh, we have the saturation issue so uh, the limit in terms of the the G magnitude so those are faint stars and we are getting a spectra uh, I, I compared a few I, I don't I didn't put the plot here but I compare a few of them with the um, with the this long spectra and it is five five times better in terms of the signal to noise so. And I just want to finish with uh, this quote from uh, the first director that we had at McDonald Observatory, Otto Struve. And uh, he said that one of the first tasks to be, take, to be undertaken by the staff at McDonald Observatory will be to, to investigate further the mysteries of the White Wars. This was said in 1939. And here we are in 2020, is still working on White Wars at McDonald Observatory. <laughs> And this is the picture of uh, one of my favorite telescopes, which was named after him. So this is the Otto Struve uh, 2.1 meter telescope. So yeah, that's, uh, we're still here doing the same size. It's, it's still remarkable. <laughs> well, thank you. I'll take any questions. Thank you. Some virtual applause. <laughs> All right, we have time for questions. Roman, go ahead. Uh, with this uh, spectra, you know, the quality of the spectra, would you be able to uh, see metal lines in the white dwarfs? And how many of those from just the optical spectra you would say are consistent with being, you know, DZ, DBZ, DAZ, and so on? 
I mean, yeah. we, we know, for example, from UV spec spectroscopy that actually, you know, these days people say that 30 up to 50% of the white dwarfs are actually metal polluted, metal enriched. Uh, and of course, in the optical, it's more difficult task, but, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, not, I'm, I'm not an observer, but I can see, you know, some maybe hints, for example, in this uh, figure, you know, third uh, uh, on the left, third uh, from top, there are some hints of maybe absorption lines. I don't know. <clears throat> Yeah, the so the, the resolution is is not the best. So we have here the resolution is uh, about two thousand. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So it's two angstrom. So it's not not uh, great for very you know because some of those lines require very high resolution for us to see better. Mm -hmm. um, we would be able to see. Yeah, I think the, I, I always. Calcium triplet is outside of this range, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so I, I have seen, um, so I found, um, so from so my, my first sample, which was the DR1, I actually found uh, four that were uh, DBs, but I haven't found anything much more complicated than that based on the colors. We found a lot of DCs, which are the continuous spectrum, so then we can start seeing some of those those lines, but I haven't seen anything uh, very much different, but our sample right now is just a hundred white dwarfs. But we have just this is just the the beginning of, of the survey, pretty much. But okay, yeah. Thanks. But the, the the cool thing is that we can always go back and look at those stars with the same instrument, or look with the high resolution spectrograph and get better spectra of the, the interesting targets. So yes. Mm -hmm. Kanya had a question too. Um, hi, Barbara, that was a really great talk. Um, are you in these papers that you have in preparation, are you publishing the parallaxes and the proper motions for the? Yes, I'm, I'm publishing the, all the, the cross match information that we have with that, yes. And how many are in the southern sky roughly, do you know? Or... Um, so we, we cannot see from the in the southern sky. Oh, okay. Only, okay, okay. Yeah, so it, the, I think the limit is, oh gosh. I think Equatoria we can see, yeah. We, can, we cannot see very, very far south because uh, McDonald is plus 30. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah, yeah, okay. Okay, thank you. Can, can you again show this footprint of the survey? Yeah, actually that would be helpful. Let me see if I can. Yeah, this one. Yeah, thank you. So, what are these red uh, red dots and black dots in the in in a thousand in in the thousand? Um, yeah. So this is the so this is the galaxy. Um, so there are several things here. Let me see. Um, so the, there are some uh, red things here. So this this field here was actually. Um, it was a, a galaxy field that that we actually got access to. Uh, this is the main survey here. But what is the stripe in the, in the bottom of the figure? I mean, oh, this one here. Stripe. Yeah, I I'm not entirely. Yeah, this one here. Seems so like... this sounds like it should be inaccessible, right? Um, yeah, I think I think they are trying to use a uh, uh, different. Uh, uh, telescopes to actually try to do something. So they had uh, some talks about using salt as well. So. Ah, uh, okay. Okay, sorry. Where where is I just missed where you were pointing? Where where you said the this south is the south part here? Yeah. So there was uh, some some talks uh, about using, mm -hmm. but they were they were actually uh, this is the main head uh -huh. Okay. Okay. And I this is some additional uh, galaxy. There's another red point right here. <laughs> Oh my goodness, there's some little red points now that I'm looking in detail. <laughs> but this is the main head next to you. Does SALT also have a virus spectrograph or something like it? Well, they, they were talking about, so yeah, yeah, no, they, it doesn't have yet. So they were they were talking about uh, using other, um, uh, some additional uh, uh, telescopes and, and there was, but this is this is mostly. I I don't have any data here. The only data that we have right now is is from here, 
I should have made it more clear, yeah. And how good a spectroscopic mass can you can you get from from spectra of the quality you're you're getting? From the white dwarfs? Yeah. Um, actually, from um, from this here. Well, it, it depends on the. Um, oops, sorry, don't go inside. Okay. Um, so it depends on the, the signal to noise. And uh, one thing that we do uh, to fit the spectra is not only uh, feeding the spectra, but uh, those lines actually, the hydrogen lines in the models, they, they don't exist at very high temperature, then they become deeper, 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 and then they have a maximum or a minimum, as you would say, and then they become shallower, shallower, and then at lower temperatures, they don't exist. So um, if we would have just the line information, we, uh, we would have a, a hot and a cold solution. Uh, this is always the case if you, if you have issues with, if you don't trust very well your flux calibration. Mm -hmm. So one thing that we add to, to the fits here, we give some weights to the, uh, to the colors that, that we would have from Sloan or, or the Gaia information as well nowadays. So, so they have different weights that we put. So in order to actually try to, pinpoint the, 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 I don't know, it, it, it sounds like <laughs> to redo the flux calibration or to even fine tune the flux calibration to make sure that we um, are, are happy with all of that. Um, so in terms of, for instance, this, this first one here, that would be an uncertainty. So we fit uh, temperature and log G, and this would be uh, an uncertainty of 0 0.05 dex in log G. And uh, this one here, or I mean, for a lower resolution, uh, then it becomes a little higher than that. So it would be 0.1 maybe in index. But uh, we, we, don't, I, we don't use only the, the spectra, also the, the colors that we have, all the information that we have, we try to, try to use. And, uh, and, and one more thing that, the lines closer here are the ones that will give a better information to the log G because those are the higher lines so we can measure more the pressure of how close, mm -hmm. you know, the, the, that's the measurement pretty much of the log G. So this is. How many of these have like Kepler K2 or test data as well? Kepler K2. I'm just wondering if you have any, if there's any pulsation data on these as well, or they K2, even none, none of them. <laughs> Tess, maybe, <laughs> I, have to, I have to look into that, but K2, none, none of them. Yeah, I just had a student to go through all the, the K2 campaigns and there's no, it's not the same uh, footprint yet. Yeah, but, but yes, I'm going to get my yes. student. So let me take a note here. Get my student to look at the test data now. <laughs> yeah, but I thought like the the magnitude range is quite quite different from test. Yeah, that that could be. So I, I might have some overlap, like at the 16, hopefully. Fingers crossed. What but cadence yeah. would you need to get a to get a useful oscillation measurement? Uh, white wash typically uh, start to pulsate at normal masses, uh, which which would be a typical white wash at a uh, hundred seconds. So uh, with uh, Kepler, we Kepler and K two, the two minute cadence was just the limit for us. But since the, but since it had, I mean, but typically, I mean, a hundred, two hundred seconds. So two minutes was okay. Um, I wouldn't go more than that. <laughs> that would be too difficult to, I mean, it would wash out and we would miss out all those short periods. So I can't remember in the extended test mission what their cadence is for, for full frames, but it's, it, it, may be, it may be two minutes. Um, in which case, you know, they would not have yeah. the stars that were targeted, you'd be able to, to go. 
Yeah, yeah I, I can look at, I mean, I'm, I'm definitely, I haven't looked into that yet, but I'm definitely going to get, get going. That's actually a good idea, Matt. Thank you. <laughs> okay, great. If there's 